Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session entitled Caring for the Carers from Skatari to South Sudan. I'm Group Captain Dai Lam, a member of the Defence Medical Services. So a little bit about myself. I'm the current Defence Professor of Nursing based in Birmingham at the Royal Centre for Defence Medicine. I qualified as a nurse back in 1988 and went on to specialise in intensive care nursing before joining the Royal Air Force in 1995. In my 25 year career so far, and I have no idea where that time has gone, my postings have taken me across the UK as well as overseas and included posts in clinical staff and academic appointments. My current research focuses on the psychosocial impact of military duties on our personnel, as well as building their resilience and improving preparedness for future operations. I must say I am delighted to be here as part of the Nightingale 2020 conference, albeit virtually, and sharing some of my work to add to the catalogue of phenomenal nursing activity that's going on around the world at this moment. In the next 15 minutes, I'll discuss the psychosocial aspects of nurses when they first deployed in support of military operations in 1854 and comparing that to more recent times before going on to describe an innovative project to better prepare UK military personnel for deployments of the future. So as we know from Florence Nightingale's accounts, nurses were not trained for the role they would undertake, nor were they prepared for the sheer number of casualties and indeed the level of trauma that they would witness whilst there. To add to that, their presence were not, was not welcomed by the doctors on the ground and that situation added further challenges to the working environment. So can you imagine, they'd already undertaken a long journey to get to Turkey, already fatigued on arrival. They had no situational awareness, no idea how long they would be there. They were away from their coping strategies, away from their support infrastructure of family and friends. So how would they cope and do the best job that they possibly could whilst deployed? Although similar things face our personnel in operations today, with combat operations recently in Afghanistan, we moved then on to support the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, and more recently in support of the United Nations missions in South Sudan. So again, we have those similar environments into which we must immerse ourselves, but we undertake collective training prior to deployment that immerses us in a simulated environment to match that that we will be exposed to on operations and therefore we're provided with cultural and situational awareness before we leave enabling us to build that team dynamic with personnel with whom we will deploy. One of the examples now that I will give to you is a proof of concept. How do we make that better? And studies that I have undertaken have identified that although our preparedness training is as good as it can be, it's not necessarily as good as it needs to be once personnel are deployed. So I'll use our medical emergency response teams as an example of setting that proof of concept and enabling us to test whether or not this new technology will go some way to address some of the gaps that our research has found. So our medical emergency response teams currently train in an environment that you can see. Now this simulates the back of a Chinook aircraft, which was the platform of choice during Operation Herrick in Afghanistan. And they run moulages to test the teamwork, the, the way in which they will operate on deployment but it wasn't realistic enough. Our studies have shown that it provided an idea of what the role would be but it was very reliant upon the directing staff providing the details of the clinical presentations. So we had Rusosiani which was the, the, um, the patient, the casualty, but the directing staff would need to tell you what you could see, feel, smell etc. So we thought about this and initially the proof of concept as to whether this would provide us with an alternative training needed to be realistic, portable 
and inexpensive. So we trialled the virtual reality uh, platform initially. Now the picture you can see on the screen is Professor Bob Stone who heads the Human Interface and Technologies team at Birmingham and we've been working with him and his team since 2016 to try and overcome this gap in our training capability. Now Risosiani, as you can see, has been replaced by a very lifelike, realistic weight and, and appearance model and Prof Bob is there working at the time with haptic gloves just to trial what was available at that time as to whether it would meet our requirements. We moved on to using what you will be familiar with is the gaming trackers, one of which would be in each hand and through the headset this showed as a disembodied hand. Now as you can see there was a slight disconnect with the patient underneath and then the digital overlay and in essence the hand disappears into the chest wall which removes that subjective presence and that, and that realistic um, training environment. Plus the fact you could not see the rest of your, your arms or you could not see your legs. So it was a little bit dis disproportionate to what you would expect in that clinical environment and also it would be like undertaking your clinical practice with a couple of spoons so it clearly just wasn't going to work for us so then we moved on to consider mixed reality is that an innovative solution well i'm sorry to burst the bubble of the game of thrones fans in the in the audience however this technology uses green screen um, technology and it potentially provided us with a solution that was going to be much cheaper than Hollywood. Um, it combines the best of the real with the best of the virtual. So anything that appears on a green screen has a digital overlay and therefore you can be anywhere in the world that you want to be. And the marks on the, the green screen and on the side of the horse's head, I'll bring you back to that because that's another component that we're going to uh, utilise going forward. So in a military scenario, the green screen is just not going to work because the majority of our, our equipment, etc., would just disappear into the background. So we've incorporated blue, blue screen, as you can see. And this was in 2018, this picture was taken to provide us with an understanding of the project at that time as to whether there was enough realism, sense of present te technological acceptance by the people that were undertaking training and also whether or not they could actually interact. So this is the view from the outside of the, uh, in, uh, the, within the enclosure, sorry, and this is through the headset. So that same scenario is what the student sees. And you can see that their fine motor skills was not impacted. There was a slight, there was feedback in that there was a slight disconnect in the depth of field, but that was quickly overcome. So you've seen that they're in a blue enclosure, but actually they are immersed within a Chinook aircraft. So I'll show you a demonstration now of the proof of concept to date, but there are caveats because during the COVID restrictions, we've had to improvise. And so this clip was filmed inside one of the team's garages. You can hear the overlay of the sound, which was again feedback from our, from our uh, research, and that immediately immerses you within that operational environment. You can see that you can actually touch the real patient, and you can see your own hands. You, if you look down, you can see your own feet. And then the environment is 360, so again, you are completely immersed. The picture ahead of you is the Tempest Pro, the equipment that we currently use. Eventually that will be um, just an overlay on the screen, but this was again a proof of concept as to whether it would work. And that is controlled from outside the enclosure by the directing staff. We also wanted to test the use of avatars, and as you can see in the background, they're the early iterations, but it provides us with an opportunity to have alternate activity going on in the background. This, ex this example shows you the 360 um, surround 
and also you can see the topology through the windows and the the movement of the shadows as they would normally appear so you are you do get that sense of presence you do believe that you're in the real environment and then at the press of a button the student hasn't moved but this is now a Royal Marines landing craft, another platform potentially used for an, an evacuation. Again, the, the topology is appropriate, the, sounds, the sound files are appropriate, and you do get that sense of motion because the shadows are moving in, in line with the waves. So again, you are completely convinced that you, were, you are where you are meant to be. And then a final example, this is a hovercraft. Again, realistic interior and the patient hasn't moved. And again, we have the movement and the shadows. So this gives us an appropriate opportunity to know that part of the, part of the uh, requirement was for a portable and inexpensive uh, and realistic environment. And I think we've achieved that so far. Another part of the um, project was to develop the directing staff and the console the, that they would use. And the picture that you can see here provides you with all of the screenshots that are currently activated through the cameras. So the directing staff can manipulate the physiological parameters appropriate to whatever the intervention is from the clinician. At the bottom left of the screen, you can see the modularized process that you can literally drag and drop. So if there's a specific training requirement going on, you can extend that. Likewise, you can remove elements from the scenario so that the student doesn't get to expect what's coming next. The other point is the eye tracking capability and that's something that we're working on at the moment but within the headset you can sense where the student is looking so when you undertake the after action review and play the videos back in real time if a, if a student doesn't necessarily um, appropriately respond to a specific scenario you can see in the bubbles of attention where they were distracted and rehearse and overcome some of those limitations. So I take you back to the digital overlays and I take you back to the Game of Thrones and apologies that the uh, Night King wasn't surrounded by his living dead characters after all. But some of the fiducial markers, as you can see, this, the mark on the back screen and the mark on the horse's neck, that is something that we've also utilised in the fact that the software recognises that marker and then provides the digital overlay automatically on the final view, transposition of, of whatever image that, that you require. So this is something that we're currently working on with our same patient as, as you will now become familiar. And this is blistering, but we've always had a problem in the fact that Rissociani, we can't make changes happen to the skin pallor etc and and also with a blistering scenario that, that we show you here this is primarily a qr code pla placed on the the chest of this particular patient or on the face or whatever and the software then picks that up and automatically overlays the image that you can see there so in essence learning on the job as in florence nightingale's time creates a huge psychological burden for nurses as it did in Scutari. So preparedness is absolutely key to, to enable the high standard of team performance that we, that we require uh, in the current challenges associated with our uh, deployments. And equally this applies to the civilian sector. Any scenario can be overlaid in the same green screen or the same blue screen manner as, you, as you've already seen. So 
I'm more than happy to, um, to be contacted. These are some of the uh, references that we've used, as I say, to feed back in this short space that I've, this short timeline that I've got to, to talk to you today. But if anybody wants any further information, and I can interact with the Human Interface and Technologies team at, U at the University of Birmingham with, to support any queries that, that you may have. So please do contact me and my email is available on the screen. Thank you very much for your attention.